to me the swords that close that shows me which way that is north. Oh, it gives to me a battle axe which shows me which way is south. Stops copies me. You stops copies me. 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 Have you guys noticed a trend over the last few years that seemingly everyone and their mother has begun incessantly using the term? Bruh. I don't know about you, but I can't seem to have a single conversation with people on the internet without it inevitably devolving into a completely meaningless series of threads. Well, I initially assumed this was just typical online inanity, I was shown something that was somewhat odd and piqued my interest in this seemingly meaningless but endlessly repeated sound that has made its way into the general cultural milieu. Bruh. bruh. That made me begin to question if there could be more behind the bruh, bruh. a deeper meaning to this moronic memeing. Why would I question this, you ask? Well, because of the great bra moment of 1850. Now, if you look here at this very scientific graph, we can see it right here, which uh, uses the number of times a word pops up in publications over time, you can see that bra has seemed to appear and disappear from the zeitgeist at various points during modern history in the English language. As you can see, while we are currently at peak bra, there have been surges of bra in the past, seemingly coming and going over time. But imagine with me, if you will, a pastoral scene of old. We come across a small local tavern at sunset. The sounds of chatter and the light of a warm fireplace colors the facade as scents of stew and ale fill the air. Upon entering, you come across the people of the age and time, engaging in the colorful speech of the day. Wow, what a time to be alive, right at the height of the Irish potato famine. It was just the potatoes that were affected. At the end of the day, you will pay the price if you're a fussy eater. <laughs> The Great Bra Moment of 1850 is not alone as being a meme moment far before the modern age, for if we again look to Google Books for similar tracking records of the word yeet, we will see that there was also a great yeeting which occurred in 1839. Does this mean that our ancestors and predecessors were yeeting on one another and having Eben Bra moments? Well, it sure seems like it just looking at these contextless graphs. Now, of course, when we take a quick moment to stop pretending to be R-worded, it's easy to see that these spikes in the use of the word bruh and the use of the word eat originating in the 18th and 20th century had nothing to do with how people actually spoke at the time. In the case of the Great Bra Moment of 1850, several books or articles were published regarding a species of Sumatran monkey, the southern pigtailed macaque, which at the time was known as bruh. Similarly, in the case of the ultimate yeeting of 1838, that's a result of the spelling of the word yet being spelled as yeet, gaining some popularity in publications during the time period. Both of these seemingly bizarre trends, as we perceive them from a modern perspective, have pretty rational explanations. And therefore, this is all completely meaningless, because people in 1850 probably weren't having a great giant bra moment. Similarly, no one was yeeting anyone else in 1838. Case closed, question answered. Video over. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Because I'm an extreme sped, I was so tickled by the concept of bruh and the great bruh moment of 1850, I became interested in the simple idea of monosyllabic sounds being mimetic over time, and that these kinds of monosyllabic sounds could disappear only to reappear potentially hundreds of years later. And I wanted to know, is there any evidence for that? The evidence is there. Well, friends, yes. Yes, there absolutely is, because there always is. Let's delve into the very real area of research, the stupidest thing I have ever done on this channel, mimetic phonetics, vocalizations, social networks, and how memes spread, live, and die across social networks. Given that I've already completely debunked the premise of the Great Bra Moment of 1850, again, why would I continue to investigate this concept? Well, because it has a lot of rational bases across various fields of scientific research. Even if we can simply and easily enough explain the Great Bra Moment of 1850 or the yeeting of 1838 as simple changes in spelling or taxonomy, is there any reason for us to believe that memes can resurface over time as a general concept? But before I get to that, first let me tell you about this video's sponsor, NordVPN, because you're about to sit down and watch an hour-long video on the science of bra moments and memes, and because of that you might be interested in keeping some of your browsing history private. If you enjoy weird things like this on the internet, NordVPN is the best choice for staying secure, protected, and anonymous on the internet. I've been using NordVPN for almost a year now, which is why I took this sponsorship, because they offer a great service that allows you to connect to over 5,200 servers across 62 countries worldwide. Let's say if you're in Burgerland, like myself, and you want to watch a region-locked show like Eurovision, a VPN is pretty much the only way you can 
can catch that content. With an unlimited bandwidth and super fast servers, Nord is my personal recommendation in VPNs. And what's awesome is that it doesn't just work on PC. You can take Nord with you anywhere you go on your Android or iPhone. Plus, it's risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee, and it's cheap. If you go to the link in my description box, you'll get a whole 75% off discount on a three-year plan from NordVPN. That adds up to only $2.99 a month. And even better, you don't even have to pay with a credit card, as Nord accepts both PayPal and Bitcoin. With growing censorship happening across the internet to people of all political sides and opinions, NordVPN can provide you with security and protection that you need to freely enjoy weird videos like this one. And now that I've given you my little ad read, let's logically move into a discussion on social contagion and the ideas that we know as memes. Get it? Because I just tried to sell you something. Anyway, first let's define what a meme is. Well, I'm sure you, my beautiful big brain audience, are very well aware of what a meme is. We need to establish a consistent definition, and for that, let's go to the seminal, Richard Dawkins, who regardless of what you think about his politics, really is the father of memetics, and defines a meme as, quote, a unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation. In other words, memes are these tiny little tidbits of culture that spread across networks via either copying and imitation or learning. They have always existed. A lot of times we tend to think that memes are a new thing, but they're not. They've popped up long before the advent of the internet. Consider the Kilroy symbol. I mean, while it might now be associated with catastrophic failure, it has been shared around cultures for about a century, crossing societies despite lacking any strong meaning or linguistics beyond being in on the joke of what is Kilroy. With that definition in mind that Dawkins has given us, can these units of cultural transmission then, these memes, disappear from common social use only to reappear later in time? We could certainly say that about the Kilroy thing, but is there any better evidence? Well, let's look at social media. Cheng et al. 2016 observed the memes posted by Facebook users, so data were probably collected in 2014 and therefore mostly was comprised, I'm guessing, of garbage tier boomer memes like this dad joke that was assessed here, rather than, you know, dank post-irony memes that the patricians among us prefer, in order to answer this question of whether or not memes could reoccur after they disappeared. And they found, yes, that's actually pretty common. 40% of all memes shared on Facebook reoccurred at least once after gaining initial popularity. And if a meme reoccurred once, the likelihood of subsequent sharing and reoccurrences increased by 20%, indicating that memes are like onions. Wait, no, wait, they're like Pringles. Once you pop, you just can't stop. Got my memes mixed up there for a second. Oh, he's so Pringles. Where your curly mustache at? The researchers also found that memes tend to peak in popularity in bursts and valleys, temporarily disappearing from a network only to resurface later, at an average of 32 days of silence before a meme is reposted, but with a maximum within their analysis lasting 280 days. That means a meme remained dead for almost a year only to resurface. But there are tons of examples of this hibernation nature of memetics, such as resurfacing interest in internet memes regarding Minecraft in the current year plus four. Stop combining everything with Minecraft! Okay. Even the massively popular Ricardo memes, which resurfaced in 2018 and 2019, are a reoccurrence of an old existing meme, as Ricardo, with his iconic red bandana, his perfectly sculpted booty, has been floating around the net for almost a decade. But rather than fade into the annals of the web, Ricardo gained his greatest popularity only after years of lying dormant. Finally, restoring balance to the world. It's interesting to note that similar findings that we see in culture have been reported in research, such as by Zhang, Zhu, and Zhao in 2017, who isolated certain sleeping beauty memes, as they called them. That means that memes tend to have times when they wake and times when they sleep. These times tend to come in spikes, only to return again to silence. Similarly, Chang et al. found that some memes tend to disappear for long periods before reappearing, but that 26% of memes analyzed were described as evergreen, such as to be shared pretty much evenly across time. This was most common across memes which were only moderately viral. While memes that tend to explode in popularity may be as likely to fizzle out as memes that gain very little traction initially. Consider any poorly thought out Spongebob meme like Savage Patrick or Caveman Spongebob. They gain major traction for a few weeks at most, and then they fade into the abyss. It turns out that moderate virality creates shared cultural transmission that is more likely to be evergreen and constantly shared. The doctor thinks you're basic. Thus memes which remain moderately popular over time, simple utterances like bruh, yeet, or ooft, which have all shown up frequently over a long time now to the point of modern ubiquity across social media and online communication, are evergreen memes. 
But there's something last to note about the Chang et al. analysis, which is the notion of diversity within networks and the spread of a meme. They found that the more diverse, more multi-ethnic, more multinational a social network was, the greater chance there was for a meme to spread. That sounds like a duh moment, not bruh. a bruh moment, but it might be why something like bruh, bruh, which is a little bit more generally comprehensible and very simple, would spread across international networks online, rather than more local memes that require localized knowledge. Given that Cheng found that 28% of people, that's a relatively large percentage, who were exposed to previous memes were also exposed to subsequent new peaks in popularity, memes therefore may also be spread amongst groups that are already aware of their meaning than they are to spread to new community members. Meaning people might just be sitting in a little circle and brawling at each other and no one else understands what they're doing. If you've reached this point in the video and you have no idea what I'm talking about by this bra moment, let me provide you with an example. So, um, bruh. 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 <laughs> 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 but similar findings are reported by Blashki et al. 2012, who asked Marky Zucky for some sucky sucky and collecting information. to allow them to manipulate the feeds of users on Facebook to contain a link to an article posted by a supposed friend. Interestingly, while those who saw the link were more likely to immediately share it, eventually that same article tended to be spread across social networks about evenly, but it was spread more quickly and more commonly when it was shared by a friend. What makes this all more complex and interesting, at least to me, is that links from weak social ties, that is not your best friend but a friend of a friend, were more likely to spread across networks, meaning that minimally linked influences are most likely to become contagious in a social network. Although exposure from a friend increases immediate resharing, long-term influence tends to be spread from these weak third-person ties, relative strangers to the network. So when we consider the diversity of networks in predicting the spread of a meme and its reoccurring nature, then from these data, we can surmise that it is those on the periphery of our friend and social groups that may have more influence. Raise the possibility that someone brought forth this same monster from whence it came to exact that revenge. From whence it came? Spending way too much time around you. I mean, I hang out with a bunch of Europeans, so perhaps the diversity of that type of conversation is responsible for my relatively excessive exposure to the bruh mean because it seems to be a little bit more universal, but who knows? Well, actually, I have some guesses. Taking further data from Zhang, Luo, and Jia, 2016, who illustrated that larger networks are more prone to result in meme exposure. So it seems that larger networks, more diverse networks, with more sharing, create an environment for subsequent sharing of memes with others. Smaller and more isolate networks may instead develop their own insular memes, but these are unlikely to be spread wide to overall networks because of language differences or because they're a little bit too just personal. Oh, son of Hasmoth! Shots. Okay, you got me. I have no idea what that is. Because the larger network memes seem to utilize more simplistic language for transmission. Across global networks, this makes sense due to language and cultural dissimilarities that simpler memes are just more widespread, which was reported in Lainset and Vulade. Oh, yeah! 2017 of Estonian memes. They found that Estonians tended to share some normy memes in Estonian, but they also tended to share normy English language memes that were unmodified when the memes concerned what they call easy topics, such as animals and sex, although hopefully not in tandem, as well as general internet behavior. And while I have to mention that woo, according to the assessment of the tippy top apex dank memes that were posted by Estonians in 2015, indicates that Estonia has absolutely no chill, and I can now say I have read an academic paper on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> There is further evidence for the idea that memes are adopted from a general widespread social network and then made into individualistic society or network-based memes. This is probably why the meme template format is so popular. It's universal. And to be universal, simple's better. For example, Zhang et al. 2016, in an assessment of Chinese internet users, reported that of all of the memes or statements that gained popularity during the year of assessment, it was the most simplistic meme or statement, lipstick on a pig, that was by far and large the most common across time and popularity in Chinese users rather than more complex political or social statements. 
So at this point, all we can do is continue to delve into this nightmare topic by looking at what type of meme tends to survive and propagate. And for that, we can look to Koskia 2014, who specifically examined the lifespan and growth of memes based on memetic similarity across populations over time and the 562 memes that they posted, as well as the subsequent offspring memes that were generated from their meme posting based on these original meme templates. Take this socially awkward penguin meme. I mean, please take it. I, I can't stand meme templates. But the point is that template memes by their nature produce a lot of offspring memes, that is, repetition which is similar but not identical to the original image using the same format to convey meaning. Koskia found that while newer memes tend to produce a lot of offspring memes, that eventually falls off, instead resulting in the propagation of many memes which, while similar, are all optimally distinct. That is, the popularity of a meme relies both on its similarity to things that we understand and its uniqueness or dissimilarity, making it a unique meme in comparison to others. I see that we are not so different, you and I. We laugh alike, we think alike, at times we even drink alike. You could you can lose, lose your, your mind. mind. As we can see from this cluster analysis, there are tons of small little tiny offspring memes that are high in similarity but low in popularity towards the center. But more shared and more preferred memes that get a lot of attention, while they're still related to each other, they exist at some difference in relative similarity. While people like offspring memes, they only gain prominence when they themselves are also distinct. And when considering a meme like bro Bruh. or yeet, these simple monosyllabic vocalizations are highly similar to existing memes both in meaning and in sound, yet they are unique in enough and simple enough as to be prone to prominence. To summarize this, we can look at Dr. Limo Schiefman's excellent primer on memes and digital culture, which you can find linked in the description, priding herself in, quote, taking Gangnam Style seriously, which I certainly applaud. An organization that blackballs any performer who reveals a magician's secret. She states, quote, in an era marked by network individualism, people use memes to simultaneously express their uniqueness and their connectivity. She makes note of the infamous Leave Britney Alone meme or scandal involving similar linguistic exchanges with differing meaning, such as Leave Chris Crocker alone. That's memetically similar in terms of the vocalization, but not in terms of the meaning. The vocalizations involved in Leave Britney Alone is very similar to Leave Chris Crocker alone, but they're different memes. <laughs> Leave her alone! Leave Chris Crocker alone! One is a parent and one is an offspring. She describes this as a founder-based meme originating from an identifiable source. But she also states that there are egalitarian memes, which seem to emerge across all populations, sometimes seemingly simultaneously or across different social networks, such as lolcats, which is again infectious, horrifyingly, across world populations, as we saw in the Estonian sample. It seems that the more simplistic a meme, though, the more universal it is, hence the historic repetition and popularity of memes such as the Numa Numa dance, proposing that people select universal memes and then individualize them for specific cultures or settings. So we might have tons and tons and tons of these little tiny offspring memes, but we're going to have far fewer large parent memes. This means some memes are universal and specific to individual cultures, but ultimately Dr. Schiffman describes a model of meme success as a combination of the following. Simplicity, humor, and group participation. That's really important to consider as we move ahead. Because, well, what is a meme like bruh or yeet or ooft? It's maximally simplistic, it's humorous, and it is rife for public participation, which is both a recognition that we're all in on the joke and simultaneously it serves as a form of social affirmation. And we have good reason to believe that we're all using social networks and social media for the purpose of social affirmation as Ken et al. 2016 found across activists from the Occupy Wall Street movement that they use social media for self-affirmation as well as in order to obtain information. This matters not just for the short-term sharing of some lit and dank memes, making us feel a little bit more accepted when we get them likes. You're breathtaking. You're all breathtaking but also because it increases identification with shared in-groups, or at least it did for the Occupy protesters. Gaining social affirmation online was also related to increased likelihood to participate in Occupy protests. Thus, something like bruh, bruh, which is seemingly universal, simple, and easily comprehensible across languages, which produces a form of social affirmation when we all share it together as a form of shared mimicry, is primed to be particularly strong and robust and long-lasting as a linguistic meme across populations and networks. 
we all know not all memes are as simplistic or weirdly esoteric as bruh or yeet or oofed. As Masudi Witten and Dunbar noted in their work, that information that's commonly spread across social networks actually tend to just be gossipy in nature, revolving around third-party relationships. We've certainly seen plenty of examples of that phenomenon recently, represented in the various cases of pro-Jared, Holly Conrad, and Heidi O'Farrell, Toddy Westbrook and James Charles, KSI and his brother Deji, and even now Milo Yiannopoulos and Lauren Southern seemingly getting into it, all exposing or being exposed and gaining immense attention for a short period of time for airing their dirty laundry. While it might be easier for us to spread information across social networks via gossip, some people will always be outside of the loop, and for those people, the more simple the memes that don't require watching, I don't know, multiple 40-minute long exposés, time that is much more well spent listening to a socially awkward sped talk about the science behind something that never happened for 40 minutes in certain networks, these memes might have more longevity and prevalence across the entire network. The more simplistic memes probably went out. These fads come and go, but they dissipate. It's the Sleeping Beauties that are long-lasting. Social spread across networks does not just pertain to simple vocalizations or even more complex memetic sentiments and structures, such as gossip. There is some significant research within the social sciences that reflects that those within our shared networks might not just be sharing memes, but also be sharing possibly negative behavioral trends. A incredibly famous study now by Christakis and Fowler followed social groups of over 5,000 participants for 32 years, long before the popularization of online social networks, and tracked the body weight of these social groups. And they found that obese people tended to cluster together socially. That is, if your friends, particularly your friends of the same sex, tend to be overweight, well, you're more likely to be overweight as well. Specifically, they found that having obese friends made one 40% more likely to be obese themselves, and that friends of friends of those who were obese were 20% more likely to be a thick boy. It's not all bad, though, as a similar study from the same people, Fowler and Christakis 2008, also found that happiness spreads across social networks like a virulent STD. Across a 20-year analysis, people with happier friends tended to report being happier themselves. And while perhaps the most influential measure was mutual friends, direct friendships across same-sex dyads had the greatest impact on long-term reported happiness. We mimic one another across our social networks, not just in our memes, not just linguistically, but emotionally and physically. Our behavior changes because of the people that we're around. But the ultimate question is, why are we doing this? Why do we copy behavior which are not necessarily socially advantageous. Well, to understand more, let's look at social learning theory. We have these units of cultural transmission, these memes. We know that they spread across social networks and that they can be avenues of spreading everything from emotions to physical differences, such as obesity. And of course, our favorite, memes. But why do we share these things with one another? Be they feelings, behaviors, or bruhs? While Christakis and Fowler have argued that, at least when it comes to obesity, it's probably likely that people develop a warped perspective that heavier body weight is the norm due to social exposure, is there in fact a deeper psychological basis for this mimicry or copying behavior? Albert Bandura, in his seminal and now very famous experiments on social learning theory, proposed that humans learn more from watching than they do from random trial and error behavior. Bandura's experiments, and for overview see Bandura and Walters 1977, had young children watch an adult either play gently with a Bobo doll or go full American History X on the thing, and found that children tended to replicate the behaviors of their parents, being more aggressive towards the doll when they saw an adult being aggressive towards it, and that this increase in arguably violent action towards the toy, you know, the purpose of which is to punch it in its big stupid face, extended to exposure to adult aggression viewed on a television, resulting in increased child aggression towards the Bobo doll. In other words, watching a parent directly or seen on TV made children more aggressive towards the doll when the parent was aggressive. And this research is still one of the primary rationales that those who insist media exposure causes violence use as proof. Because Bandura discovered something in these experiments that kind of turned conditioning on its head. Before Bandura and those in his same line of research, the primary theory on how people and animals came to learn things and learn behaviors was through conditioning, of learning that certain actions would result in rewards and others in pain or punishment. But Bandura had now illustrated that we often learn behaviors despite receiving no reward for the replication of that behavior. Another study from the same line of research indicated that both adults and children tended to be more likely to mimic those in a higher position of social power, the more affluent, in this case being the children who possessed more toys, being seen as more influential. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> <laughs>
Bandura argued that we tend to learn socially through mimicry, because individual trial and error can be quite costly, not only in our time expenditure, but potentially to life itself. We don't give 16-year-olds the car keys and put them behind the wheel and tell them to have a good time, go grab me a sandwich. We show them slowly how to drive, because the trial and error option would mean a heck of a lot more car accidents and more injured kids. Okay, so it was a bumper car at Coney Island, but it's the same basic principle. <sighs> But you may be thinking, hang on a minute, Aiden, I learned plenty of things on my own in my life through experimentation, and you're not alone. I sure have as well. It's not the case that we all learn all things by watching others, but rather that social learning is more effective in some instances or cases, particularly in dangerous ones. While individual learning may be more advantageous in others, specifically when climates and societies change. Rogers 1988 developed a mathematical model to explain how the population remains generally balanced in terms of the number of people who are more individual learners and those who are more prone towards social learning, because of the necessity of of both individual learners and social learners over time. Individual learning is required during changes in environment, he posits. While environment is stable, more people will utilize simplistic social learning strategies. However, when the environment is in flux, when things are a little bit topsy-turvy, previously adopted social learning strategies are probably no longer viable. And thus, the number of individual learners in the system will increase in proportion until enough of them exist, such as they can all be copied by the social learners. Once again, all things in balance, as they should be. We also find a little bit of a genetic component here, as Rogers found that this tendency to rely more on social or individual learning was passed on from parents to offspring. In other words, our societies are in a perpetual cycle of mimicry for the purpose of simplifying our lives and learning for part of the population until that knowledge is no longer relevant, and then it is left up to the independent thinkers to develop a new behavioral strategy that can therefore be mimicked by the social learners, and round and round we go. I am functioning within established parameters. Established parameters? <laughs> you sound like data. I am an android. Yo, what the? I see. This isn't just pure speculation, though, as it's been demonstrated through experiments, such as this one conducted by McElrath et al. 2008, which, similarly to the mathematical model of Rogers, asked participants to play a game to determine behavioral patterns. In this case, they were essentially playing Farmville. Once again, we're being drawn back to Facebook boomerisms, and they found that people tended to use social learning first to determine better crop strategies by observing their neighbors. But then after they had engaged in the social learning, they tended to attempt to quickly destroy their competitors rather than continue to mimic them. But of course, this potentially leads to long-term problems when the mimickers are ill-equipped to cope with change in the game structure or the rules. These findings provide some evidence for the claims of Rogers in that people do tend to engage in social learning when it is most advantageous towards them, and subsequently, they do suffer when they desist in their monitoring of others to learn new behaviors, which ultimately makes social learners more successful during periods that are stable and less successful during periods that are in flux. There's also something to be said of popularity and normalcy when it comes to mimetic repetition. Some of the first research on conformity to norms was presented in well-known experiments from Sheriff all the way back in 1935, who had participants look at the projection of light on a wall in a dark room and estimate how much the light moved. Then he purposely matched up two participants with very similar estimates with another participant who had a very different perspective of the light's movement. Over a series of trials, the participant with the differing opinions slowly began to adopt the opinion of the other two people in the experiment. Another famous classical experiment from Ash 1951 asked participants to determine the length of a line segment in a group environment. Unbeknownst to said participants, all of their fellow line guessers were actually research assistants. They were confederates, who would intentionally report the line as being longer or shorter than it really was. Ash found that one third of his participants answered incorrectly and reported the length of the line as in line with the reports of the majority. They just went along with what others said, despite it being obvious that the majority was an error. The other critics told me to be mean, and you should always give in to peer pressure. But what if someone bad tells me to- Always. This kind of social learning indicates that we often move towards what is popular rather than what is most individually advantageous, but if we tend to be social learners more commonly when it comes to potential dangerous behaviors, choosing the correct length of a line is a pretty benign task, and might have explained why many participants in this experiment dissented, with one at one point saying out loud, I always disagree, darn it! Very spicy language for the 1950s. And while there is plenty of time-honored research on conformity, far more than it could be covered here, further evidence on the evolutionary model of individual and social thinking, as proposed by Rogers, can be illustrated in Jacobs and Campbell, 1961, who used the same autokinetic light experiment that was used by Sheriff to follow how far the light moved in conjunction with Ash's conformity experiment. 
Initially, the participants were in a room full of Confederates, who incorrectly guessed how much the light had moved. But one by one, the Confederates were removed, and more naive participants were added. And they found that while some people tended to conform to the erroneous reports of the Confederates, this was a fleeting behavior that ceased very quickly after the Confederates had left, and returned to a norm similar to that found in the control groups, indicating that the effects of social conformity change across generations based on the number of present independent opinions. Interestingly though, Zucker 1977 replicated the Jacobs and Campbell experiment so we're now three layers deep into replication here, folks. But that time, participants were told they were either independent actors, part of a small group, or a member of a large organization of others, and he found that participants primed by the belief that they were part of a large group, a social network of office workers, maintained perceptions closer to those implanted by the Confederates, while individual thinkers returned to similar meanest controls. Those in the larger networks were slightly less sure of the accuracy of their reports than those in the small networks, and were far less so than individual thinkers. They felt more pressure to conform and comply to the answers of the group, but they found that making decisions about the movement of light was much more simple. In other words, they had to think less. And knowing what we know about humanity being cognitive misers and wanting to think as little as possible, it makes sense to utilize this strategy. Don't blurt out your answer. What number comes between two and four? Two and four. Start from one. The prophecy is true. Although I should note that, somewhat in contrast, another dang replication of the Zucker study, and we're now four deep into this bad boy from Kaneda and Nakanishi 2003, found that when groups were allowed to naturally form under the same sort of conditions, they actually came to more accurate estimations of light object movement. This finding may only further confirm that social agreement can have both benefits and handicaps when it comes to solving problems. This seemingly contradictory finding may in fact illustrate how less serious subjects of learning are perhaps solved more accurately by by the group rather than by individual thinkers. And it's not without external basis to believe that groups of more lower IQ people might be as good, if not better, at problem solving than groups of high IQ thinkers, as illustrated in Wooly et al. Who is it? It's Wooly! He's yelling something! No, not that one, 2010, and Engel et al, 2014, who found that the most successful groups when it comes to problem solving were not groups of big brains, but rather people of a higher collective intelligence rather than an individual intelligence, as well as better communication skills, but who may possess slightly lower than individual IQs, again indicating the potential value of social learning over independent thinking, at least in some instances. There also may be differences in individuals that result in more or less copying behavior, such as found by Sewells et al, 2000, in their triadic model. They gave freshmen several profiles, two of fellow undergraduates who were similar or dissimilar to the participant in terms of hobbies, one local shop attendant, and a senior working at the registrar office. When asked about which person's information they would like to know more about for their own college experience, you know, potentially engaging in some social learning from these other people, participants generally preferred to model the more experienced student and the more similar students who had shared interests. This indicates that while we might defer to experts and replicate their behaviors in some instances, we also tend to defer towards the more similar, such as a flaw of social learning that we might not always model the independent thinkers or the more expert thinkers, but rather instead focus on those that are both experts and close to us. This means that social information may not be shared equally across a large system, but may instead tend to congregate in mimetic networks of similar people and be more replicated when it comes to expertise. You can tell me I'm a doctor. No, I mean, I'm just not sure. Or can't you take a guess? Well, not for another two hours. You can't take a guess for another two hours? Or at least that seems to be the case when it comes to a serious consideration, such as going to college. But what about more casual concerns, such as preference for films or television, since we're talking about hobbies here anyway? Is preference for things that are inconsequential, socially contagious from experts, or more from people who are like us? In a second round of studies, Sewells and colleagues told participants that they were more likely to enjoy a piece of fiction if someone with similar tastes also enjoyed it. They then gave participants descriptions of two people and their opinions on specific works of fiction, either being similar or dissimilar to their own, as well as an option to select a professor due to their higher social status, but who didn't list their preferences in films. When it came to entertainment, while the experts, the professor, was still preferable over someone who was completely completely dissimilar in terms of liking movies. Unlike the prior experiment, people tend to mimic those who are most similar to themselves in personality rather than defer to an authority figure when it comes to mimicry, at least in terms of the trivial, the things we might find a little bit more mimetic on the internet. In a final illustration of how this affects our feelings, an additional experiment from this work found that people who were told someone had the exact same tastes in films that they themselves had, being drawn from the participant's own report of liking films, having their name removed and then just passed back to them, well, when they were told that that fictitious other 
liked or hated a movie that they were about to watch, it affected the way not only they predicted that they themselves would like the film, but it actually impacted their enjoyment of the film after they watched it, all being based on bogus opinions that were replicated from their own reports of film preference. So while we do tend to socially mimic, we can see that we don't all mimic all the time, and we don't always mimic the same people. So even though there may be more individual or social thinkers in a society at any given point, these tend to remain in balance across our various social networks and across the various different structures and environments that populations exist within, with social and individual learners fluctuating depending on changes in the environment. If it sounds like what I just described sounds a little bit evolutionary in nature, some trends and some memes will survive while others will dissipate, or dissipate across smaller or more homogenous or more similar populations, some are passed down throughout generations of tendencies towards more mimetic patterns, and some remain in flux as the environments tend to fluctuate. If that sounds a bit evolutionary, it's because I think it is. So let's move on into understanding the evolution of memes. For decades now, evolutionary biologists have been kind of poking the anthropological, sociological, and general social science community, imploring them to consider, please, the biological and evolutionary aspects of culture. But if you're the kind of person listening to this embarrassing, pedantic exploration of bruh, bruh. moments, you might also be the kind of person who follows things like new real peer review, and know that the social sciences are often plagued by academics that tend to think that things like biology don't real. So despite Masudi writing a treatise in 2009, which I mean really outright begs social scientists to look into the biological and evolutionary nature of culture, and an entire book pleading the same from the absolute leading scholars in the study of this thing, that is, cultural evolution theory, Richardson and Boyd, continually writing articles and books doing the same, there is still a dearth of interest in the social sciences towards evolutionary culture. I'm sure as heck interested, and I hope you are too, because I think it will explain a lot of what's going on here with these bra moments. But if you speed up 40 days recording into a few seconds, this is what you get. Why do we have these memes? Why did we develop them from an evolutionary perspective? Our squishy pink bodies might not look like it at first glance, or, oh, or at second, ugh. But humans are incredibly good at adapting to our environments, much more so than most other animals. From the freezing temperatures of the Arctic Circle, to the low oxygen Andes Mountains, to the dank hill depression of Ethiopia that often sees temperatures of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's over 50 degrees Celsius, where people literally just beat salt out of the ground for a living, humanity is the herpes of the animal kingdom. Human thought is so primitive, it's looked upon as an infectious disease in some of the better galaxies. <laughs> That kind of makes you proud, doesn't it? Huh? Psychologists, including famed cognitive psychologist Dr. Steven Pinker, have proposed that humans fit into a cognitive niche of evolution. While other animals evolved wings to fly or claws to attack or armor to protect, we evolved into the one strategy that no one else in the animal kingdom was seemingly using, intelligence. <laughs> But we've seen that we're not all individual thinkers now, are we? We're not all individually intelligent. For that very good reason, we are often group thinkers. And there's a lot of evidence for that. If human adaptation was inherently individualistic, then we would expect more technologically advanced humans, for example, to inherently outperform those with less complex technology and easily adapt to a new environment with their more advanced technology. But this has repeatedly been shown to not be the case. King William Island may look like a frozen hellscape, be because it is, but it actually is an isle that is rich in animal resources if you know which resources to harvest. And it has been inhabited by the Nitzelik people for thousands of years. Yet in 1846, when British explorer John Franklin and his crew arrived there, they all starved and died. The remains of their ships weren't even found until the mid-2010s. Yet it was not so many years later that Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen traveled to the same island and lived among the Netzelic people, learning from them and how to live on the available food. Which absolutely does include stuffing dead crows into seal carcasses and then fermenting them. But hey, a meal's a meal, I guess. I told you that little tale of the Norwegians dabbing on the Anglo because it indicates that cultural transmission of information may often outweigh technology and independent thought. Be gone! The point is not that Franklin and his men died because they were stupid. They died because they lacked the proper social information that was gathered over a millennia of both independent thinking and social replication within the Inuit culture. 
so stupid. For the same reason we don't just take teenagers and throw them behind the wheel of a two-ton murder machine, cultural transmission of information using both language and social learning via watching of behavior to convey information is evolutionarily advantageous. And it gave humans the edge. It gave us that cognitive niche to not just adapt, but to thrive, seemingly no matter where you put us. Thus, Boyd and Richardson, in their various works, cumulatively have a few suggestions as for why and how humans evolved socially, and why culture is inherently related to biological evolution in its nature, contending that it is through the independent trial and error process, which results in human repetition and mimicry, that allowed Homo sapiens to be uniquely skilled at adaptation. For example, Boyd notes that the Fijian people naturally discovered which foods or fish are more dangerous for pregnant women to eat, which lines up with what modern medicine would still recommend, but that the passing on of this information was more influenced by friends and family members rather than wise or medicine women. But what this means overall is that unlike other species which generally react only to their environment, our cognitive niche has given us a way to learn socially and pass that social information on through repetition and mimicry to improve our adaptation and aid in survival. Societies that then adequately and properly use both independent thinking and social learning, therefore, are societies that are more likely to pass on their genes, indicating an inexorable link between culture and genetics. But here's why memes are pretty cool. Because they are much more capable of evolving quickly in response to changes in the environment. While it takes generations for populations to change on a genetic level, memes can change much more efficiently to convey useful changes in survival strategies across populations. Uganda Knuckles, everybody! Can someone please help these poor Knuckles find their way? They are looking for their queen, they are looking for their commander. Next, me! And those of us who adopt the more strategic memes are more likely to pass on our genes and so on and so forth ad infinitum. In their 2008 book, Rikerson and Boyd suggest that, among many other things, before humans fully developed language that would separate them more distinctly as individual cultures, with language as Boyd would later posit in his 2017 book, having a greater effect on culture than any other factor such as locale, although there were different tribes, they all probably knew each other to some degree. And when communication was limited to simplistic vocalization forms that we adopted from our common primate ancestors, early humans were likely to have very similar interactions with other groups of humans, and have those interactions on a fairly frequent basis. They propose that the concept of altruism, of being kind to thy neighbor, that we find across the modern human species, therefore, developed due to a shared desire for the species of humanity to survive before we were distinct. But as language and cultural divides came into the mix, we began to isolate into shared group favoritism over outgroup favoritism. Yet, based on this genetic prehistoric tendency for treating others the way you would like to be treated, altruism remains across much of the population. No other species expresses reciprocity the way that humans do in the concept of owing goodwill in response to others for their good actions. Thus, again, we see that language has evolved to be affiliated with positive social outcomes. Humans cannot survive in a void, in a vacuum. We specifically evolved language, we specifically evolved memes as a process of transferring not only necessary, but socially affirming information. Our genes and our memes are inseparable. Kojima was right all along. Kojima is good! Kojima is a goat! Kojima is a goat! Everybody say! Kojima Mimetic is a goat! Blackmore 2001 contends that we are genetically compelled towards memetics and that which memes and from whom said memes originate will determine who and what we are likely to copy. She suggests that memes and genes are inherently interconnected and that research on this lies in cultural evolution theory. She states that the human brain is good at copying some kinds of memes and bad at others. Songs, stories, and rituals have long taken part in meme gene co-evolution, while math and reading are relative newcomers using machinery that was not designed for them. This again indicates that simple memes that are comprised of simple vocalizations are probably more likely to be spread across networks than things that are more complex. In the same line of thinking, Laland 2004 proposed three types of evolutionary mimicry. Copy when uncertain, copy the majority, and copy if better. We will tend to use these copying strategies when they are most context appropriate. Given we have seen examples of all of these strategies in the earlier parts of this video, we could begin to look at memes from an evolutionary perspective more closely. Rikerson and Boyd have proposed that the reoccurrence of memes over time is much like biological creatures, evolutionary in nature. In order to further describe the evolutionary nature of memes, let's look at what Darwin laid out and how it might apply to cultural evolution, as summarized here by Masudi and Lysette, 2009. The aspects of evolution 
evolution are as follows. 1. Variation. Individuals within a species may vary in their characteristics. For example, finches may vary in the size of their beaks. 2. Competition. Resources are inherently limited, and as population size increases geometrically, the capacity to reproduce one's genes is limited based on skills of survival. For example, if finches with larger beaks can open a wider range of seeds, then larger beaked finches will be more likely to survive and reproduce than smaller beaked finches. And 3. Inheritance. Parents produce offspring that resemble them more than the total population. For example, larger dicked, oh, excuse me, beaked finches are more likely to produce larger beaked offspring. Masudi and Lysette further explicate these same Darwinian tendencies in human society and culture, specifically defining these exact same three aspects of variation, competition, and inheritance as a function of human communication thusly. 1. Variation. Cultural information varies within and between groups of people. Different people hold different beliefs, attitudes, and values, they use different words, they exhibit different skills, and so on. 2. Competition. Cognitive resources, that is our attention or memory, are limited such that not all beliefs, attitudes, words, skills, and so on are successfully learned, remembered, or passed on to others via social learning, and that some people are more likely to be modeled than others. And 3. Inheritance. Individuals acquire their beliefs, skills, values, and so on from models via social learning such that there is a correlation in cultural variation between learners and models. And as we've seen from the research on cultural transmission, Jacobs and Campbell and Zucker and so on, as well as everything else we've looked at, it seems like this makes a lot of sense. But let's apply this evolutionary strategy specifically to memes online. When comparing them from this perspective, the stronger or more useful, either functionally or socially affirming, meme will eventually win out over time. It may become temporarily recessive in terms of its prevalence, yet re-emerge later in time as systems and societies change. Why is this so hard? That's what she said. Oh my god, what did I say? inheriting some memes while others die out based on environmental context. So how does this specifically apply to viral memes and their spread? We can see that from the evolutionary perspective in a recent study from Fisher 2019, who tested a model of meme diffusion by looking at how people would choose to combine multiple schema of concepts. Schema in this case he defines as a three-bit set of connections of existing ideas that we use to help form our understanding of the world. A schema is basically just a mindset of a small idea. He found that single schema are more likely to be utilized and repeated rather than a combination of schema, even when the two schema are related. For example, both Mexican and Vietnamese restaurants sell food. They share a schema. But the reason you don't see many Mexican-Vietnamese fusion restaurants is because the concept is a little bit confusing for us. We're anticipating one or the other. As a result, the restaurant is likely to be categorized in our heads by a single definition, say Mexican rather than Vietnamese. Combining schema has a selective and preferential choice for one aspect over the others. Given that we are cognitive misers and using our big brains takes a lot of energy, this makes sense as it reduces the noise within our heads of how many ideas we need to juggle and consider. As a result, the findings of Fisher lend support to the idea that memes are a subject of cultural evolution, survival of the fittest. Some memes will inherently be more potent than others, and when we combine ideas or concepts, one will survive over the other. And thus, even as the number of schema, the number of things we have to think about, increases within a system, recombination of two different schema, of two memes, actually decreases the number of total schema that survive. One consumes the other just as I absolutely would consume a Mexican-style banh mi sandwich. Magnificent microwave casserole. So going back to our ridiculous premise, where does bruh, bruh. fit into this evolutionary model? Well, bruh, bruh is quite similar and probably originated from the word bro. And because such a term is probably more easily due to its simplicity, in the competitive mimetic marketplace of culture, meanings can converge and replace each other potentially. Bruh, bruh. does not have the same meaning as bro. Bro insinuating friend and bruh being, well, bruh. bruh. But we already have bro, which is an accepted linguistic and mimetic schema. That allows it to be probably more easily converted into a similar but optimally distinct meme with new but related meaning, eliminating less previously dominant schema left over from bro with bro Bruh. replacing it. Bra finds its mimetic legs both in its similarity to existing schema, but also in its syllabic simplicity. But is there any more research on that specifically? Well, as you should know by now, yes. The evidence is there. We have to ask the question, is there something about the short, simple nature of something like bra or yeet or oof that make them specifically mimetic? And for that, I think we have to look at the evolution of language. 
Nettle 2012 examined the ways in which language differs across cultures, as well as the use of different types of language characteristics across various phonological and morphological aspects of language. That sounds complicated, but let's break it down. Linguistic morphological complexity refers to the extent to which language conjugates one word to more thoroughly define time and space. Be wobbly, timey wimey stuff. That is, there is a bra moment, there was a bra moment, and there will be a bra moment. While phonological complexity involves the number of mere sounds within a statement. Look at this word. How do you think that's pronounced? You might be confused by that exclamation point. I know I was at first and I mispronounced that word in a recent video. That's because the kung people are a bunch of kangs of the clicking sound, which gives them a more expansive vocal catalog than other human languages, which lacks the vastness of sounds. The rest of our languages tend to have reduced phonology and therefore increased word length and complexity. Further, paradigmatic complexity is the amount of pure information contained within a linguistic unit, while syntagmatic complexity is the pure number of creed units within the string. Nettle found of his analysis that more commonly spoken languages had greater paradigmatic complexity, less syntagmatic complexity, meaning more information in shorter syllables. While in regards to morphology, languages with more speakers tend to have less paradigmatic complexity and more syntagmatic complexity. Which, if someone asks you why English is one of the most commonly spoken languages in the world, well, despite it being incredibly difficult to learn, it might be because our language tends to have a lot of paradigmatic complexity and lesser syntagmatic complexity. And I'm sure you wouldn't get that from watching my long ass videos. But Nettle was also able to trace sequential production of linguistic tendencies across generations, which is the really cool evolutionary part here, starting from an initial linguistic body and subsequently socially transmitted linguistic templates onto new generations. Unlike DNA and our understanding of genetic evolution, cultural evolution makes it such that within the same generation of people, some traits may actually be selected and others forgotten, ultimately producing a continually and consistently evolving mimetic linguistic proclivity in humans to always take the language tendencies of the past and integrate them into their modern communication while also adapting them. This is again individual learning plus social learning. P A R A K T D T P one. So when we look at a simple monosyllabic utterance such as bruh, we may eventually wind up in an eternal cycle of brine, given that the term is paradigmatically, syntagmatically, morphologically simplistic, involving the most basic of vocalizations with the maximization of mean within it, similarly to yeet, to ooft, to lol. These are very simple utterances that convey complex meaning. We are the keepers of the sacred words. Bruh. The fewer morphological, phonographical, syntagmatic a phrase or an utterance such as a monosyllabic term of the nature of bra or yeet is probably more powerful over time across all cultures because of its simplicity and its ability to convey maximal meaning and therefore minimize energy expenditure. Actual bra moments may be indicative therefore of a collective sharing of valuable social information regarding shared group status across particularly wide social networks as a method of avoiding complex thinking and reaping the rewards of social affirmation. But as always, now that we've got a grasp of this phenomena of social transmission, social learning, social network theory, and cultural evolution, we need to understand why we share these schema of why we share these behaviors. And for that purpose, we may be aided by looking at animals, particularly our close relatives in the primates. Dunbar 2003 proposed that language developed in primates in order to communicate in more complex ways as the size of the group grew larger and more complex in its socialization patterns. But McCombs and Semple 2005, in testing this proposal, using data from 42 primate species found that vocalization repertoire was instead more closely related to the co-evolution of grooming behaviors and vocalizations in increased group size, indicating that vocal range results in more socially cohesive and larger groups of primates. By combining vocalizations limited in our common primate ancestors, given that they lacked a descended larynx that would allow them to have the same vocal range that we do, our ancient human precursors would use both grooming and vocalization to develop an increased increasingly more complex, cohesive social group. And in the process of doing this, they evolved capacity for greater vocalization. For without vocalization, primate groups probably can't grow beyond about 50 members as found in this research. But these aren't just speculations. We can see evidence of the complex use of vocalizations in relation to group size from, for example, this case study from Gudison LaRue and Bergman 2012, who specifically examined Galatis and Chakma baboons, two closely related species genetically with very different social structures. 
The Galatas live in large groups with occasionally over a thousand members in a very complex society compared to their biological brothers, the Chakma, which live in small harem-like groups of rarely more than 15 members. God, I wish that were me. While Galata Chakma females expressed 50 different calls in comparison to Galata females, which use 72, the real difference in here is with the dicks, not the chicks, with male Galatas using three times as many vocalizations as did Chakma baboons, who lacked many of the vocalizations for expression, including mating calls, screams, and yawns. And if you've ever noticed that yawns tend to be socially contagious, it's likely because of this genetic predisposition. Because yawns communicate with a simple vocalization, a potentially very complex meaning. And by the way... <laughs> this means that primates that began to adopt more vocalization patterns were more capable of supporting larger and therefore safer and more genetically diverse, healthy, and socially oriented, cohesive societies. It is through the inclusion of vocalizations that likely would have produced our human ancestors, who from these more complex and secure communities would have arisen with these vocalization patterns that supplement much of the more time-consuming grooming behaviors that our primate cousins use. Without needing to spend time on grooming, they could begin to develop tools, which in and of themselves can be socially transmitted. Literally, monkey see, monkey do. Monkey see, monkey do. That's it. Monkey pee all over you. That rhyme. And eventually move away from simply gathering food where you find it towards planning, problem solving, and ultimately raises this ancestor out of Africa and into modern Homo sapiens. This can be further illustrated in Dobbs in 2012, who found a distinct difference in the size of the neocortex in primate species with bigger brains and broader facial expressions, belonging to the more social and the more vocal of the apes. This increase in brain size was also reported in Schultz and Dunbar 2007, who found that primates with more sexually integrated and larger community sizes tended to have larger lobes. Big brain baboons, small brain simians. When it comes to Homo sapiens and our enormous eggheads, we can see the unique role specifically of vocalizations and language in humans in allowing for a streamlining of the transfer of skills, illustrated in Morgan et al. 2015, who had a bunch of college kids try to make some basic Paleostine era flint tools and found that those who were taught with language over visual emulation, just watching, you know, if you're into that, and even gesticulation, you know, if you're into that, from an instructor were the best at replicating the tool. Language was the best way of teaching. And as such, as language and social interaction develops in its complexity, the brain develops along with it. Memes and genes are inseparable. Further, Boyd 2017 reports that across a sample of Pacific Island societies, those with larger populations tend to use more tools. Tools, therefore, are a function of imitation both in primates and in man, but information is more thoroughly transferred using vocalization. Dunbar 2012 also proposes an additional aspect concerning the development of vocalization in primates, which is that socialization produces endorphin responses. And given that endorphins reduce our feelings of pain, socialization might make both us and our primate cousins more resilient to pain by allowing us to receive a jolt of endorphins when we hear the sign of socialization that conveys meaning of social cohesion. Both us and our primate pals are using this to supplement grooming behavior. And as he anticipated, Dunbar found that humans who watched a comedy film expressed an increased pain threshold in comparison to those who saw a more neutral film. No, it's a joke. See, I became a doctor because of the movie Patch Adams. Watching a funny movie makes us more pain tolerant, and comedy is a really good example because laughter is something that we share with other primates. Monkeys laugh when they toss hot loads in part because, I mean, well, it's funny, but also as a method of conveying positive social meaning to other monkeys, which again means less time needed for the physical social grooming aspect typically needed, now replaced with a simple sound and a shit-flinging grin. No other animals do that. Hippos don't walk around like, <laughs> good one. They don't do that shit. Given that spending only 10% of their time engaged in social grooming behaviors greatly increases the likelihood that female primates will defend members of their same social group against outsiders, which plateaus after about 10% of time spent, vocalizations allow for more free time while maximizing the benefits of the pain tolerance and the safety cohesion that socialization brings. While humans and other primates are among the most social of all animal species, we are far from the only ones to use vocalizations. And among social animals, few are far more cohesive in pair bonding than humans, than our birds. And interestingly, we find the same trends in our similarly social feathered friends.
Schultz and Dunbar reported that birds are more social and prone to pair bonding than other animals, but a review of research from Witten and Masudi 2008 illustrates that social learning has been examined across many animal species, from the lowly guppy to primates to our feathered friends. Since Dawkins' original discussion of the meme concept in the selfish gene, birdsong has long been related as an animal analog to memes shared by humans. Have you been a naughty boy today? <laughs> You're not a f***ing legend at all. Did you bash up the dog? And there is some strong evidence for this, specifically as it refers to monosyllabic memes. Again, the bra moment. As Burnell 1998 examined the songs used in different populations of building savanna sparrows in the Southern California region and found them to use distinct multisyllabic calls within their individual groups, but that monosyllabic calls were shared across all species. Similar reportings were found by Baker and Gammon 2008 in a study of vocalization memes from chickadees. Memes which were more common across groups were more likely to persist. However, they did note that their core memes for the chickadees were longer than memes which failed to gain popularity across groups. So chickadees had longer general memes, so it may not be totally true that across all animal species the more simplistic the call, the more shared it is. But rather this establishes that sounds are more likely to be repeated across groups. Could we relate this tendency in birds to humans, and our seeming propensity towards simple vocalizations such as bruh or yeet or ooft? Am I saying that we're all essentially a bunch of feather brains repeating a simple vocalization to feel like part of a group? We get high. <laughs> oh, no, me too. I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> me too. I mean, kind of. So let's come to some conclusions. First, I want to really tell you guys thank you for sitting through this. I know it's very long. Get alive. <laughs> <laughs> And I also want to stress that I only scraped the surface of the subject of cultural evolution, social learning, social networks, and vocalization patterns here. For that reason, I've linked a few books in the description for your perusal, but based on what I've talked about today, while there was no great bra moment of 1850, I think that we all maybe find it funny because on a basic evolutionary level, we know that it was possibly true. People are inherently prone to memeing, to mimicry, and in many cases mimicry is better for solving problems and for social affirmation, to remind us that we are an accepted and therefore secure member of a social group, something which is necessary for survival in Hobo Sapiens. Because to be expunged from social knowledge is a death sentence, much as it was for the Franklin expedition. It seems that perhaps the more simple a meme, the more likely it may be to have long-lasting effects that live beyond what we would expect to be a normal human lifespan. It could transcend across time across cultures, across even different languages. Much as altruism has spread across early humanity and our proto-linguistic lines, and how birdsong maintains core vocalizations, so too is it possible then that in modern humans, monosyllabic vocalizations are one of the most common and therefore powerful means with the greatest longevity. If memes influence genes and vice versa, then yes, it's quite possible that there could have been a great bra moment of 1850. There could have been a great bra moment of 1050. Given that memes can be sleeping beauties to peak in popularity, then to vanish only to peak in popularity again, well, I absolutely cannot tell you which memes will become popular, but I think we have some good ideas about what kind of memes are likely to be resilient, and those are the ones that get to the most basic core of human socialization. As stated earlier, humor, simplicity, and I think most of all, interaction. We all want to be welcomed and accepted. Repetition of memes which have no value other than social interaction may seem frivolous to the outside observer, but these may actually serve an important role in human socialization. But hey, what do you think? Are memes encoded into our genes? Why else might we all engage in this weird collective and repetitive behavior? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Again, there's plenty of supplementary material in the description. I eventually will have to do another video on memes because I had to skim over a lot of stuff here and if you see how long this is, it took a while for a reason. If you enjoy my work, you can support me any way you see fit, be it on Patreon, Subscribestar, Streamlabs, or by buying some merch, all of which is linked in the description below. And a massive sincere thank you to all of you, my wonderful supporters, for your generosity and kindness that allows me to produce this kind of inanity or insanity, I'm not sure which. Thank you guys so much. I will be attending two speaking events in August of 2019, one in Chicago at the International Conference on Men's Issues and at Minds IRL in Pittman, New Jersey. Tickets are available below and you can get a 10% off your ticket to Minds IRL by using the code Aiden. Again, this video is sponsored by NordVPN, so if you're looking for the best in internet security and protection, check below to get 75% off a three-year plan, again, just $3 a month. Finally, if you enjoy my spat and train, you want to see more of me for some odd reason, I play Pathfinder every Tuesday on Knuckle Lavie's channel, wherein I recently bullied a mushroom to steal booze from it. All linked in a card, 
and below. And as always, Altana Volt. <laughs>